Avatar The Last Airbender is possibly one of the best stories ever told with its complex characters, well-developed world and brilliant story. Which is why the M. Night Shyamalan's live-action take on the series hurt me in ways I will never be able to explain. It was a horribly made death really threat to everything that made Avatar The Last Airbender great and is the sole reason I go to see Linda in therapy every Tuesday. Here. But now, apparently, one attempt at adapting a fantastically animated show which made perfect use of its medium of animation was not enough. Nope, Netflix watched that hot piece of garbage and thought, you know what, we could totally pull that off. Six years later, and their adaptation of Avatar is out for the world to see and the reception is... definitely mixed. I mean, you can just look down in this very comment section and I promise it'll be a flame war going on. See what I did there? But, you know, now that you're down there, you might as well click subscribe and like, right? I mean, fantastic! Ignoring both super fans on Twitter who ignore every problem the series has and haters who are still hurting from the 2010 adaptation and go out of their way to nitpick the entire series to death, I do think that there's room for an interesting discussion of whether the series managed to pull off what they were aiming for, as they definitely did do a lot of wrong but also did a lot of good. First of all, it's important to mention that the live action made a lot of changes. Some of these include completely removing Sokka's character arc about growing out of his sexist views after being humble, Aang's desire to be a child who doesn't actually want to be the Avatar, Katara's motherly nature as well as her temperament, completely removing the threat of Sosa's comet from season 1, lessening Roku's role as the Avatar mentor. And I'll admit, a lot of these changes are genuinely bad. Changing the characters in a series that is renowned for having fantastic characters was always going to be a dumb decision. And you can really feel the absence of these character traits in the series. Sokka isn't funny anymore, and him not having a character arc to go through on Kyoshi's Island makes his involvement in the plot just feel like an afterthought. Sokka doesn't even grow and show Suki that he's actually a great person who's capable of learning from his mistakes. And so, Suki falling for him just feels kind of forced. It feels almost shoehorned in, as a, well, this happened to the animated show, so it has to happen in the live action. They do try and give Sokka an arc with him not really being suited to becoming a warrior and his father being disappointed in his capability, but again, I just don't see it working. Sokka wasn't the best warrior in season 1, yes, but that is not because he just inherently lacked talent and is more suited to be an engineer, but rather because he simply lacked the training and the means of improving. Besides, Sokka being a bad warrior and making his father disappointed in him just doesn't really make sense. It's true that Sokka was never the strongest or the fastest, but those weren't what made Sokka a great warrior. Sokka was a natural born leader who shined in finding the strengths in those who worked with him and making use of them. He was creative and clever, which meant he was able to compensate his physical ability with strategy and clever ideas. Most of all, Sokka was great because of his warrior spirit. He has always been the kind of man who will willingly walk in the front lines of a battle he knows he can't win, as long as it means that he's defending his home. So having the live action insult his abilities and potential feels like an insult towards the character. Especially when the reason he's considered lesser by his father is him almost failing a test that he cleared fantastically in the animated show. Besides, Hadoka not trusting Sokka's ability to become a great warrior just creates more plot holes. Like, why would Hadoka leave Sokka in charge of the village when he doesn't trust that Sokka can handle it? Especially when, nitpick warning, uh, there are literally other fully grown men that stayed in the tribe. Are you telling me that Hadoka decided to leave his son, who he doesn't even trust to be able to handle the responsibility of defending the village, which, by the way, has a frequent history of Fire Nation attacks, but there are literally so many other perfectly capable candidates. I'm sorry, no, I do not like the depicted Sokka's character. They removed so much and then did nothing with him, which is genuinely really sad because I think the actor who played Sokka did a really good job most of the time. I mean, have you seen that jawline? I swear this man muse for a living. But somehow Sokka is not the worst of the main cast because the live action absolutely butchered Katara's character. I would like you to do a little experiment with me. Okay, tell me a single character trait from the new Katara. Okay, ready? Let's go. Yeah, it's hard, right? 
because this adaptation stripped almost her entire character away from her. Normal Katara was carried to the point of being the group's mom, who always looked out for everyone but at the same time had a strong sense of justice and would actively go out of her way to right things she saw as wrong. She also had a big temper which she learned to control throughout the series as she got better at and more in tune with her waterbending. In this series she is… there. She's constantly nagging Sokka and seems to have a sense of justice with her being the one who wants to go along with Aang in the beginning and save the world. But after the first few episodes that just kinda disappears and she just kinda exists. She works through her trauma surrounding her mom and waterbending which I think was actually a really good scene. And we always see her training waterbending which again I really appreciate but she doesn't really have a personality. It feels more like the skeleton of the character Katara rather than an actual character. So it's hard to comment on her because most of the time you kinda forget that she's even there. Even in her own plot points. It's hard to focus on her because everything around her just has so much more personality and actually gives me a reason to care. But that all changes when we get to the end. You see, in the original show, Katara had a really great art of standing up to sexism and making Paku train her so that she could continue to help her friends and protect her family. Because of her temper and strong sense of justice, she actually goes straight to Paku and challenges him to a fight which she of course loses, but she gets to show her ingenuity along with her burning desire to be taken seriously, which actually leaves a mark on Paku, along with the entire North Pole. She stood up for what she believed in and made Paku see her perspective, which along with Paku finding out that she's her granddaughter, made him respect her and then give her the training she needs to be able to flourish in waterbending. In this adaptation, however, she gets somewhat mad and confronts Paku and then challenges him to a duel, which seems a little out of a character for this Katara, given her lack of a temper. But nevertheless, she does get her duel and it's... underwhelming. Look, I genuinely think that the bending has been a huge plus in this adaptation, with it actually looking like martial arts, and with the visual effects looking absolutely fantastic, especially fire. But it's clear that the water bending just was not on the same level as the others. It just looks so powerless, and the duel between Katara and Paku looks kind of bad. In the animated show, you can really see how water is the element of change, with Paku and Katara catching each other's attacks and using them against each other. Much like how a wave ebbs and flows in the ocean. But in this show, it just looks kind of lifeless, and a lot of the moves feel completely out of place. I mean, just look at this water flip Katara is doing. Just why? Why is she doing that? What is she even doing? She just gets on a wave and spins a bit. Even Paku looks confused. But what's even worse is that after their duel, Paku doesn't even teach Katara any waterbending. Which, honestly, I kinda get it. I also would not want to teach her waterbending after seeing that weird ass spin move. So now we think, okay, I guess Katara will just remain untrained. Will she find a new master? Nope, she just gets stronger on her own. Somehow! They try and play some Women can do it by themselves idea with Katara realizing that she is her own master and doesn't need to be taught water bending. which, sure, all the power to ya. Just one little problem though. That's not how it works! That's not how being a master works. How do you just magically get better at martial arts because you believe in yourself? You don't! Waterbending is a discipline that needs to be taught and it genuinely infuriates me seeing them treated like some random water magic that you can get a power boost in just because you believe in yourself. At the end, Paco even calls her a master, which no, that's not what she is. But again, Paku, I understand that you gotta do what you gotta do to get that weirdo out of the north. Being serious for a moment, I think this is a perfect example of one of the series' biggest flaws, which is having good ideas, but absolutely shit implementation and writing. Katara gathering all the women in the north to help fight for their home is actually a really nice development, and it's then completely overshadowed by Katara apparently being the Grey Skywalker of waterbending. Where were those moves when you were fighting Paku? Katara? I DON'T SEE ANY RANDOM SPINS! The characters have been stripped of so much personality and are just not given the chance to build up a friendship because we're always jumping from objective to objective. I think a perfect demonstration of this actually comes in episode 1. In the animated show, when Aang wakes up from the iceberg, we get a fantastic scene with each character showing their core personality traits and we see how these characters play off each other. Katara's anger at Sokka breaks Aang out of the ice and when she sees that there is a person inside 
she rushes off to help and take care of him. Sokka is quipping jokes in the entire way up until they find Aang, where he immediately starts being protective of Katara. Even such small moments like Sokka holding Katara while pointing his spear at the potential threat are such good ways of portraying his character. Then Aang wakes up and immediately asks to have fun with Katara. This scene shows everyone's personalities flawlessly, and when you compare it to the new version, you can really tell how much they took away. In this version, Sokka doesn't make any jokes or show any personality when they lose the boat, he just kind of stands there. Katara doesn't get angry about Sokka being sexist because in this version they've removed Sokka's sexism. So instead of breaking open the ice with her anger, Katara just tries to move a boat, which opens the iceberg somehow. Then when Aang is free from the ice, he doesn't show off his fun-loving personality. In fact, he does nothing because they did not feel the need for Aang to be conscious during this scene. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. They really screwed the pooch with the gang, and the future episodes really don't fix the dynamic. But speaking of Aang, I do want to say that I actually don't mind Aang being as focused on fighting the Fire Nation as he is. I mean, I still prefer the animated Aang, but what I learned very early on when watching this show is that this series is not the animated series. It's fanfiction, and the beauty of fanfiction is that it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be interesting and entertaining enough to keep my attention. And honestly, serious Aang kept my interest. Don't get me wrong, I laughed out loud when they gave Aang an edgy I wasn't training to grow my power, I was training to keep my power in check so I don't scare my friends. <laughs> because like, oh my god, get over yourself Naruto, get that Meliodas looking ass backstory out of here. But other than that, I actually think serious Aang kind of works. It might just be that the actor did a genuinely really good job but I totally bought that Aang felt responsible for not having been there when the world needed him the most. Even though the way he went out was extremely stupid. But let's focus on the positives. Even it's extremely strange that this new quest-oriented avatar never even tries to waterbend once. Positive! Like Aang's relationship with Zuko. Which, by the way, was probably the best portrayed character in the series. I really like how Aang and Zuko got to have a conversation and kind of bond even in season 1. And having Aang meet the other avatars who all have a unique perspective on what it means to be the avatar was fantastic. I love how they brought up more useful information from the books about the avatars as they are absolutely fantastic but most people haven't read them. Which, by the way, speaking as someone who has read and absolutely adored the Kyoshi books, seeing her take on a bigger role as a mentor avatar and even possessing Aang's body in episode 2 was fantastic! Kyoshi is easily the best written avatar followed closely by Kurok and if you want to see why, you can actually click this video right over here to watch my detailed explanation of every avatar. Just make sure you come back and finish this video when you're done. But speaking of episode 2, I actually really vibe with the portrayal of Kyoshi Island and how even this place, which is literally built to worship the avatar, is so afraid of the Fire Nation they won't even grant sanctuary for said avatar. It really goes a long way of showing how broken and afraid the people of this world are. And again, Kyoshi's cameo was fantastic! Replacing Roku's position with Kyoshi was easily one of the best moves this adaptation made. Roku kinda sucked as an avatar anyway, so letting Kyoshi take his place was great fan service. But also really works as her philosophy surrounding the avatar's duties fit this more serious version of Aang really well. At the end of the day, this series was never going to live up to the animated show. But at least, it's not a mockery of what made Avatar great like the 2010s movie was. This adaptation tried its best, and in a lot of ways, it did a good job. Suko was portrayed fantastically. You can see throughout the series how he's acting the way he thinks he's supposed to be acting, as the son of the Fire Lord, but you can also tell that deep down, beyond it all, he really does have a good heart. We also see how Suko was scarred by Osai, and... Well, say what you will about Suko fighting back, but seeing Osai deliberately put his hand over Suko's eye, burning him, was horrifying. But it was also interesting to see Osai actually feel bad about what he was doing. I'm interested in seeing the direction they go with it. But that's not the only scene they added for Suko. I also really like the scene where they decided to go save his uncle instead of hunting the Avatar. Which, speaking of that scene, this series did such a fantastic job 
of portraying the horrors of the 100 year war. The scene with the earth soldier and Ira was genuinely fantastic with this one actor absolutely killing it in his role. Another perfect example of this is Luke Ten's burial. Seeing Uncle Ira so devastated as he rethinks his entire life and if this stupid war was worth losing his son over was devastating. But that feeling quickly changed into reassurance and love as Suko sat next to Iroh. Suko and Iroh have one of the best relationships in all of fiction and I'm so happy to say that this adaptation did a pretty good job of portraying that. Another thing I really liked were the additions they added to the story. The beginning with Fire Lord Sosin leaking his plans to the Earth Kingdom about invading so that he could surprise attack the Air Nomads was genuinely really clever. And so was having all the Air Nomads coming together for the Comet Festival. Another brilliant addition was Suko's crew consisting of the battalion that was meant to be sacrificed as well as all the book and extra material references. Having Ko, who was terrifying by the way, being willing to trade the lives of his prey for an idol of the Mother of Faces was actually a really nice touch. Although why Roku would go out of his way to steal an idol from him doesn't really make any sense to me, but let's stay positive! Like I stated earlier, the visuals were absolutely fantastic, but it's not just the bending. The world and sets are absolutely incredible. It truly looks like Avatar brought to life and absolutely deserves high praise. I mean, did you see the Godzilla egg? It looked so good! The idea that Aang sacrificed himself to the ocean spirit and that without Yue he would have just kept wandering around forever searching for his partner is also such a fantastic addition that really makes me think of an alternative universe where Yue doesn't sacrifice herself and Aang continues to just host love for eternity. Imagine that kind of world 100 years into the future. Would the Fire Nation still continue their attack on the world? Would they win now that the Avatar and waterbending was officially gone? Or considering that the majority of the Fire Nation's forces are in the form of battleships, would Misomo continually ravage the Fire Nation's fleet? Just imagine a future where the Avatar mythos are completely gone and the Fire and Earth Kingdom now live separated because neither dare send their fleets against this giant water kaiju. Imagine how terrified people would just be of water in this world, how they would build their very infrastructure to avoid Misomo just completely killing everyone. Okay, I think I've spiraled a bit at this point. But I genuinely think it's a strength of the adaptation to give me the tools to spiral in speculation like that. At the end of the day, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is not our avatar. It just isn't, and it's never going to be our avatar. The characters in the world are different, and yeah, that kind of sucks. But at the same time, that's also pretty exciting, right? I mean, we don't really need another one-to-one -one adaptation of the animated series in live action because we actually have the animated series, and nothing will ever top that. So I'm glad they're going out of their way to explore new ideas, even if I do wish that they would explore some of those ideas a little bit better and uh, think them through a little bit more but I still think that this series has shown some potential and I'm looking forward to see the future. The events surrounding Sosin's Comet and Suko's crew being the cadets that were supposed to be sacrificed were actually really good ideas. And even if I don't like all the new ideas, I'm confident, believe, I'm hopeful, okay, I'm somewhat hopeful that they'll learn from their mistakes and improve the writing for season two because right now the possibilities are endless. Perhaps this adaptation will finally give us Satara. Maybe they will give us more flashbacks to the prior avatars. Or maybe they will reveal that firebenders are actually from the moon and the reason they're attacking the Four Nations is to gather fuel from their water and mud power spaceships that will fly them off into space. <laughs> Who knows? But I do know this. Be it smart or dumb, well thought out or genuinely idiotic, at least it will be fun either to appreciate or laugh at. Either way, it will be entertaining, and I'm definitely watching season 2. Please, God, make Asula better. How could they ruin my favorite character like that? Please make her better. Why is she so baby girl? Why is she so baby girl? Please make her better, please! Stay jinxed, guys.